from around the country who will help guide our discussion about a civilian climate core and the power of this program to create jobs, advance justice, and address the climate crisis in communities across the nation while helping to create union jobs of the future in our country. Uh, the climate crisis presents us with imminent threats, but also immediate opportunities. Uh, opportunities to make financial and sweat equity investments in our communities that build to racial, moral, and political equality. Work that rebuilds the economy and saves the planet all at the same time. Job creation that saves all of creation. That's what we're talking about here today. If done right, the new Civilian Climate Corps would do just that. This proposal is not only a priority of many of my colleagues joining us today, but also a priority of President Biden's, who included it in his American Jobs Plan and is supported by nearly two-thirds of all voters. Corps members will set to work protecting communities from sea level rise, weatherizing low-income housing, installing solar panels, and other clean energy infrastructure, restoring habitat and stabilizing shorelines, and rebuilding after climate disasters. In the negotiations on infrastructure and budget reconciliation happening right now in Congress, this message needs to be heard. Our climate cannot wait. Our young people cannot wait. And the Civilian Climate Corps cannot wait. We absolutely need a CCC in these on ongoing negotiations. In April, I introduced the Civilian Climate Corps for Jobs and Justice Act with my great friend, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who has joined us today. Uh, our legislation would establish a Civilian Climate Corps program within AmeriCorps, supercharging our already successful national service programs and employing a diverse group of 1.5 million American Corps members who would receive education and job training in coordination with local institutions to usher them into good union jobs. But ours is by no means the only vision of a, of a civilian climate corps. We have other members of the House and Senate who are joining us today who will also be talking about uh, their vision of how we should be moving forward, but moving forward this year in order to create that civilian climate corps. And we're looking forward to hearing from those members of the Senate and House today because this moment provides us the opportunity to make a core a reality. We can get core members out in the world doing crucial work, preventing and responding to the climate crisis from Salem, Oregon to Salem, Massachusetts. And so once again, I thank everyone for joining us today for this special meeting and I look forward to uh, the great discussion which we are going to have. Um, and I think we'll go to our witnesses, we can hear from each of them, and then we'll recognize the members of the House and Senate so that they can ask questions uh, of our witnesses. Uh, they're going to each discuss the economic case for a civilian conservation corps, the transformational community and career training benefits of core style programs, and the way that investing in civilian climate corps can protect and promote interest in our rural communities and public lands. So our first guest is Mark Paul, who is the Assistant Professor of Economics at the New College of Florida. He's a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute and a fellow on the Bergrun Institute of the University of Southern California. Uh, he has been researching uh, the causes of inequality in our society throughout his career. We're looking forward uh, to hearing your very important views on this issue, so welcome, sir. Thank you, Senator, and members of Congress for having me here today. And we would ask each of you, if you could, to keep your remarks just to four minutes so that then there would be a time for a robust uh, discussion with the members of the House and Senate. So again, welcome. Excellent, thank you, Congressman. So my research is on the economic and distributional impacts of decarbonization pathways. As an economist, I hope to provide some perspective on the economic, climate, and social benefits of creating a new civilian climate core. Right now, the nation is facing multiple interconnected crises, a climate crisis that is already destabilizing our environment, an inequality crisis driven in part by long uh, and persistent sustained high levels of unemployment and underemployment that's fueling poverty and threatening the very social fabric of our nation, and most recently, a global pandemic. 
While the economy is beginning to heal from the recession, we are still down 10.7 million jobs from where we should be. Youth unemployment remains in the double digits, <clears throat> and black unemployment is above 9%. Further, the structural problems of the climate crisis and inequality are only continuing to intensify. I come here today to discuss the role the CCC could play in combating these challenges. The idea is not a new one, but originated with President Roosevelt's original CCC passed in 1933 at the height of the Great Depression in Dust Bowl. The goal then was to provide meaningful and remunerative employment while working to, quote, conserve our natural resources. Within two months, the program employed 250,000 youth within just two months. Over the course of the program's existence, it employed over 3 million corps members who engage in work such as planting over 2 billion trees, assisting in the construction of 800 new state parks, and building over 10,000 miles of hiking trails, amongst many others. Today, we're still, um, we're still benefiting from these investments. In fact, I was hiking on CC trails, CCC trails just last week. Today, there's a substantial economic and environmental need for a new CCC. Specifically, a new program would stimulate the economy, generate dignified work and long-term career opportunities for union jobs, and provide vital labor to engage in essential mitigation and adaptation work. There is no shortage of work to be done. An estimated 15 to 20 million new jobs will need to be created to address decarbonization needs in the next decade alone. Creating these jobs and fast is necessary to limit global warming to 1.5 to 2 C. Failure would mean unprecedented economic and human disaster. This is precisely why Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen calls the climate change the biggest emerging risk to the US financial system. These dangerous outcomes can be averted if green investment is undertaken at adequate scale and speed. Green investments are actually some of the most potent policies that Congress can be considering. As a matter of fact, economists at the International Monetary Fund estimate that green spending yields economic benefits two to seven times larger than those associated with non-green spending. A new CCC has the potential to create millions of new well-paying jobs across the US. I estimate that 15 to 23 new jobs would be created per million dollars in spending. This translates to roughly 1.9 million jobs if the CCC were funded at $100 billion. The employment opportunities are essential to improve the long-term economic health and well-being of unemployed and underemployed workers, and is critical if they are to avoid the long-lasting scarring associated with bouts of unemployment, which especially affects youth that are graduating into weak labor markets. The economic benefits of the CCC would, re would reach far beyond program participants. The economy actually never recovered from the great financial crisis of 2008. As a result, we have an economy today that, is, um, that lost an estimated $8.2 trillion from 2010 to 2019. This amounts to $32,000 in lost income for hardworking American individuals. Replaying this failure can be avoided if we undertake adequate expansionary fiscal policy, such as funding the CCC at scale. Beyond these direct economic benefits, Work conducted by core members will, reason, um, sorry, will measurably reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Some of the largest emission reductions can occur through retrofitting of buildings, for instance. Just retrofitting the US public housing stock alone um, will take the equivalent of 1.2 million cars off the road. To conclude, the great challenge of the 21st century is climate change. But this challenge is also an opportunity. It is the spur we may need to unleash our collective efforts to build a just and equitable society, one focused on human flourishing and less on private profits. A new CCC that offers a living wage, benefits, educational assistance, and career opportunities can help set us on that path. The youth want to work. The youth want to contribute to averting the worst of the climate crisis. They want to leave this planet better off. We should not let this chance go to waste. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Paul, very much. Our second guest will be Julia uh, Hiungas. Uh, she is executive director and co-founder of the remarkable program PowerCore PHL, uh, where she develops partnerships and pathways for young people in a new green economy. Uh, 
Ms. Uh, Hiungas is also joined by an alumnus of her program, Romeo McLeod, who is now continuing to give back as a valued member of uh, the staff. So we welcome you both, and uh, uh, please begin. Great. Thank you for having us. So to set the stage a little bit, I've asked my colleague, uh, Romeo McLeod, to speak a little bit to his experience. So in Philly, we don't call it a program. Power Corps is an experience. Okay, so I'm Romeo McLeod, uh, of course, from Philadelphia, PA, uh, specifically North Philadelphia. Uh, I'm now a crew leader at Power Corp PHL. Um, at 25 years old, after dropping out of college, I had worked over 10 jobs, almost anywhere to make ends meet. Um, I felt I needed a change. I knew that hopping from job to job wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I also knew it wasn't for me. Um, I joined Power Corp in uh, 2018 and cohort 11. Um, really just looking for another chance in the professional workforce realm. Uh, I entered a program with no idea of what to expect or what Power Corps was. Um, I began really just looking for an opportunity to work in the city at the Philadelphia Water Department. What I ended up gaining was resources and a supporting culture that helped cultivate me into a consummate professional with trainings, leadership skills, uh, learning my leadership skills, on-the-job experience, with uh, a team of different people, uh, different ages. Um, I also learned the hard physical labor skills along with the soft skills needed to be in addition to any professional atmosphere. Uh, and I grew a different care for my community personally. Um, the program had a warming culture with leaders that looked just like me uh, from where I was from. Uh, by the end of the cohort 11, I was nominated to be an ACL, which is an assistant crew leader at Power Corps. Um, then I took the initiative to apply for a crew leader position with the supported staff. The experience as a member and now as staff has given me the patience as a professional, confidence as a leader, and assurance that I can not only lead, but also trust in the culture to be led. Um, you, you learn just as much as you lead. You learn just as much as you lead. Uh, I'm sorry, you learn just as much as you lead and being open to learning to lead gives you opportunities to grow. Um, since cohort 14, I've been a crew leader and giving back the energy to the people who don't know they have the ability and capability to conquer any hurdle, hurdle they face uh, as I did. Uh, I see it as my duty actually now to give back, uh, to motivate young people from my city to be more than uh, what they believe or more than stereotypes perceived for black, brown, and Hispanic people. Um, it is an honor because the program did that for me and without the program, I don't know where my life would be or where I would be led. Um, I'm grateful for the program and for people like Julia uh, who give me open opportunities to speak in a place like this, thank you. Thanks for sharing your experience, Romeo. I say. Romeo is amazing, but he's also not the outlier. So literally hundreds of young people since 2013 in Philadelphia have had the opportunity to come to Power Corps PHL. They came to us at a moment of uncertainty, and they used the core experience to springboard themselves into a career, into a future that they wanted for themselves. And so in Philly in 2013, we were still coming out of the recession. We were, had hard times. We were the poorest big city in the nation. And our mayor at the time made a key decision to address three pressing issues all together. So we think we, we wove together workforce development uh, approaches, we wove through gun violence prevention uh, approaches and climate resilience approaches to make, to amplify the impact, right? We needed every, to maximize every dollar that we spent as a public entity. But we didn't just make impact across those areas. We also were able to strengthen unions and local small businesses by supplying them with talent that looked like the community that they were operating in um, and for positions that had been going unfilled. We also were able to set a structure and a guiding mission for interdepartmental and private-public private partnerships and collaboration that yielded a water commissioner and the head of probation who had never met before in the same room, resulted in Power Core PHL being a pre-apprenticeship to a water utility apprenticeship that sources 70% of its apprentices from Power Core PHL, leads to full-time civil service and unionized positions with opportunities for growth. And shout out to DC33 for their support in that. I would just say, as everyone already knows at this table, in 2021, the country is coming out of a recession, coming out of hard times. And I said that we're here to offer an example that in order to make impact across issues, across communities, uh, you know, a climate core infused with equity, workforce development, and building on the existing foundations that we already have in our communities is the way to get it done. So thank you for having us here. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, thank you for your great work. And our, um, our final witness um, is uh, Tyson Fatone Riggs, uh, who represents the Coalition uh, of Rural Voices for Conservation uh, Coalition. Uh, Senator Wyden, he's uh, from- One Oregon. of ours. Uh, if, <laughs> would, you like to, would you like to introduce him, Senator Wyden? I'll be very brief, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, and our co-chairs, and uh, and my partner here on uh, on the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, your testimony is particularly important because what we are looking at, and some of you have seen it with respect to fires, and it's behind uh, the Congressman's bill with me, is we are looking at something in the West we've never seen before: the prospect of giant fires, multiple fires, all at the same time. And that's what uh, our Oregonians going to be talking about. And we've never seen that. You know, what happens for our friends in the East is normally Oregon will help Idaho, and Idaho will help Nevada, and we all kind of work it through. This year, as we're going to hear from our very thoughtful witness, it's going to be completely different. We could have simultaneously all of these big fires, and we're trying to get the Forest Service to... Uh, to take uh, some additional steps, and you're going to enjoy them. Thank so, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And, and if you're co-chair. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the task force, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Tyson Bertoni Riggs. I'm the coalition director for the Rural Voices for Conservation Coalition. RBCC is a coalition of rural, community-based nonprofits whose mission is to develop an engaged and diverse network of community leaders, researchers, and restoration practitioners committed to finding and promoting solutions through collaborative, place-based work that recognizes the inextricable link between the long-term health of the land and the well-being of rural communities. <clears throat> I'm honored to appear before the task force today to share my perspective on public lands, uh, conservation, and the value of a significant investment in a 21st century civilian conservation corps. So let me start by providing a little bit of context. Uh, today, we face an unprecedented combination of challenges to our public lands, to the rural communities adjacent to our public lands, and to the country as a whole. Rural communities face disproportionate economic hardship. They have yet to recover from the economic unemployment levels found prior to the 2008 recession, and poverty remains an all-too-common problem. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, in 2019, the median household income outside of metropolitan statistical areas was 52,000. That's nearly 20,000 less than in urban areas. The strength of rural economies is linked with the condition of the surrounding lands. But today, America's public lands face an unprecedented threat. These include the rising risk of severe wildfire in the West, insect and disease epidemics, loss of species habitat, and decaying recreation infrastructure. Climate change exacerbates these critical challenges and threaten to transform entire landscapes, disrupting the ecological and social communities that depend on them. In my limited time today, I'll focus mostly on wildfire. Forest Service estimates that there are over 80 million acres of public land under their management in need of restoration. That's an area larger than the state of New Mexico. While the problem is due to a mix of past land use, uh, fire suppression, and government opposition to indigenous burning practices, as the climate warms, this threat will only increase. The increase in the extent and severity of fire is supported not only by researchers and scientists, but also by the lived experience of our communities. I myself live in Oregon and had friends and family directly impacted by the wildfires of last year. Uh, they put a, over an estimated half million of re, uh, residents of Oregon, uh, or about 10% of the state, uh, in a potential evacuation zone. And this include, included suburbs of the city of Portland, our largest city. So let me put this in sharp terms. What we're seeing today is the phenomena of climate change refugees. This is a problem for now. It's not a problem for the future. I want to make it clear that this is also not just a rural problem or even a Western issue. This affects everyone through air pollution and associated health risks, the loss of forest ecosystems, impacts to our ability to recreate outdoors and the recreation industry, and through the positive feedback loop of additional release of carbon into the atmosphere. Furthermore, as with many disasters, wildfire disproportionately impacts vulnerable communities, the homeless, those living in poverty, and those living with disability. So what can we do about the combined problems of rural poverty and rising fire risk? The topic is complicated and the details do matter, but we know that we can reduce fire risk through community planning, home hardening, and fuels reduction treatments, including mechanical thinning and critically the use of prescribed and managed and cultural burning. We know that resilient forests are part of the solution to climate change, helping to store carbon while providing important resources to both human and natural communities. And we know that investments in public lands restoration can help create jobs in all communities, but rural communities in particular. What is required is a sea change in our approach to the problem. We will need to see three things. One, massive investment in existing programs used to address these risks. 
Two, development of a workforce pipeline, including entry-level jobs and advanced positions. And three, longer-term reform for how, uh, how, how land management agencies practice. Creation of a Climate Corps and passage of the 21st Century Conservation Corps Act would address two of these critical points and would show immediate results in fire risk reduction and job creation. Climate Corps would create a job pipeline to bring new workers into the field of conservation and fire risk reduction, providing a boost to the needed workforce to address these pressing issues while also creating jobs in rural communities. 21st Century Conservation Corps Act will also make critical and immediate investments in existing conservation and land management programs and will help to put a down payment on an estimated annual $2 billion of needed restoration work over the next 10 years. Additional funding from the Act will help create more of the mid-career jobs needed to tackle the complex problem of getting good fire back on the ground and continuing to plan and implement science-driven public lands restoration and adaptive management. The Act also supports the use of stewardship end result contracting, which can help produce long-term living wage jobs. Stewardship contracting allows for best value contracting, not just the lowest bid. And that's particularly important as so many of these forestry jobs are not currently union-based jobs. In closing, the 21st Century Conservation Corps Act is vital uh, to reducing the risk of wildfire and creating the necessary workforce needed. Uh, by, I'm sorry, uh, <clears throat> the 21st Century Conservation Corps Act is vital uh, to help reducing the risk of wildfire by creating the necessary workforce and making the investments needed at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Vertone Riggs. Thank you all so much for uh, your uh, great testimony. So let me let me just begin by asking a couple of questions. Um, maybe to you, Romeo, uh, or anyone else who wants to answer this. We're at the dawn of a new era uh, where we have a climate crisis, but we can solve it by having a creation of millions of new jobs, union jobs in our country. So can you talk a little bit, Romeo, or anyone else who would like to address this question about how we can turn jobs into careers, how people can get the right kind of training so that they can enter into a union and then for the rest of their careers be working in these incredibly important areas of conservation, resilience, wind, solar, uh, energy efficiency. So can you talk a little bit about that and what your hopes would be, uh, Romeo, for this program and how it could help to transform people's lives? Um, for me, it would be uh, opening up resources. Uh, like you said, due to the fact that, you know, people do need jobs, uh, from my experience uh, within a program like this, as many people that, know, that doesn't have the skills or know what skills it takes to gain that job or to keep that job or career. So uh, offering programs like, like, like Power Corps or AmeriCorps programs or even uh, places in which you can, you can uh, gain training uh, on soft skills and hard skills to maintain uh, a career and a steady job. Great. Anyone else want to take that? How, how can we take this civilian climate corps and turn it into just a, a pathway to union jobs for millions of young people. Sure. I'll just add that you have to design it in partnership with employers from the beginning, which is what we did in Philly. And so if you don't want to train to something if it's not good, if there's not a job waiting for you. We looked at the regional economy. There was 2,000 vacancies in our water utility. We worked with them to fill them. And so it's the same thing with working with private sector companies and saying, where are your pain points? They, there are emerging industry uh, jobs in you know, clean energy and green infrastructure that don't have people that are trained on that. Cores are uniquely positioned. Talk to those employers, design the training, fill the talent. Beautiful. Anybody else? So right now we have over 10 million workers that have been sidelined for our economy, not due to any fault of their own, but because we have an economy that's not producing sufficient jobs. Spending on a program like the CCC at sufficient scale can not only create jobs, but also creates additional money throughout the, the economy that then creates even more jobs. We call these, from an economic perspective, indirect and induced jobs. So every job we create through the CCC, we're going to create roughly 0.4 jobs outside of uh, the program. Um, and the more that we can ensure that these are good quality jobs, the better we are able to ensure that we actually have a reasonable floor in the labor market. Right now, we have 53 million Americans that are earning poverty wages or near poverty wages. I think it's crucial that we make sure these are well-paying, good jobs to demonstrate that people in the renewable sector um, can have a pathway to long-term career, uh, uh, careers. Finally, two out of the three fastest growing em sectors of employment are actually in green and renewable energy already. Um, the problem is they're growing far too slow to actually address our climate needs. So this is a way where we can actually supercharge both job creation and climate mitigation and adaptation. Thank you. 
I appreciate it. And uh, again, the message is the Civilian Climate Corps is meant to uh, engage in massive union job creation to save all of creation. Uh, and we know that the need is there. Uh, and we know that if we pass the legislation, we will get the result that we're looking for. Let me turn and recognize uh, Congresswoman um, Ocasio-Cortez uh, for a round of questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Markey. And I'm so thankful for all of our colleagues that are here today um, because it's it, it cannot be under stated how important and how critical a climate, a climate conservation core is, not just for the preservation of our lands and our planet, but also for young people and the underserved across the country. Um, I'll move on. <laughs> so I think what's important is that sometimes when folks say, oh, this is too ambitious or this is too big and it's too unreasonable, that we reiterate that this world that we're fighting for has already been here. It has already visited us. We've already created it in the past. Under Roosevelt era um, and New Deal era, uh, the, under the New Deal era Civilian Climate Corps, FDR's, the FDR era program employed over 2 million Americans um, in less than 10 years. A quarter million young men were mobilized three months after it was created. And that was just men. It just employed men at that time. Now the U.S. population is much larger and much more inclusive in terms of our workforce, which means the power that we have to mobilize young people at dignified wages and benefits for a job and to create a pipeline to a unionized workforce for the mitigation of climate is huge. Um, Mr. Paul, I wanted to talk a little bit about externalities, right? Climate change is arguably the biggest externality in human history. <laughs> and uh, I want to talk a little bit about why, you know, it's important that we have private sector jobs and renewable energy and, and creation, but land restoration is addressing an externality. And I'm wondering how you see uh, the, the millions of jobs created in a climate conservation core um, and the scale that you think is going to be necessary in order to address some of the externalities that will not be addressed in private sector employment. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that question, Congresswoman. Um, so for, first of all, from an economics perspective, for far too long, economists have told us that addressing the climate crisis was too costly. It needed to wait. Um, thankfully, a new economic paradigm is taking root both in Washington, but also amongst the economics per, per, uh, profession itself, where we're realizing that a lack of um, public spending is actually our largest problem right now, because we're not creating enough jobs. Now, in terms of uh, Roosevelt's New Deal, if it was simply scaled for today, we'd be employing 750,000 people a year just adjusting for the population. Um, but of course, we know that the climate crisis is a much larger ecological crisis than the Dust Bowl was. So perhaps we should even, I would argue, go bigger than that. In terms of climate being an externality, you know, the problem is, is that a lot of um, the work that needs to be done isn't necessarily profitable up front for private business, whether that be um, uh, forest management, as we heard, of, heard about in Oregon, or I live in Florida, whether that be coastal resiliency. I mean, my, my community will be underwater at 2C. There's no getting around it. Um, our, our, you look at the maps, the town is gone. Um, however, we could be employing uh, people across this nation to do meaningful work. But what matters if we want to get the economic and the environmental benefit from this program is that it's scaled appropriately. Mm -hmm. I think that um, you know we need to be thinking big here. We need to be thinking about employing hundreds of thousands of youth a year. Um, and the bigger we go, the larger climate and economic benefit we'll see from it. Thank you. And uh, one last question for Mr. McLeod and uh, Ms. Hilengas. We a really key important part of this is the justice component, that we cannot compound on the injustices that even the New Deal contributed to with respect to redlining and other forms of environmental injustice. And so one of the questions that I have is in your experiences in implementing these programs on the ground, how has this been transformational in closing inequities in communities and in your personal experience in working with young people and the underserved? Um, personally, uh programs like this build a lot of character 
in which uh, people uh, find in themselves to create even their own businesses or create their uh, own kinds of way of living. Um, you find order uh, in, in the communities in, in which people feel like it can't be no order. And uh, programs like Power Core just gives you uh, a rubric on how to be a professional, not only uh, in business, but how to be a, a great person as well. So uh, taking those keys along uh, inside or outside the work, workplace, it builds a community to, to grow to a higher point. I would just say it also sets the stage to have real conversations with employers from the jump to say, you say you want to diversify your workforce, here's the opportunity, and there's an opportunity for action and a call to action. Wonderful. Thank you, yes, thank you very much. Um, Senator Wyden. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to have a question for my Oregonian, Mr. Bertone um, Riggs. And, uh, you know, I think what you and your colleagues have laid out is you aren't going to fix big problems with small ball solutions. And I think what you did is convey a bit of the urgency that we are seeing in Oregon. My constituent, I think you described your home being in an evacuation area. Not my personal home. Right. Yeah. And I was in Medford, Oregon a few days ago. It was actually the last day in the spring. And they set an all-time 100-year history for heat. We got a call from the Weather Service in the middle of the uh, discussion, and it looks to me like we're going to need at least a $20 billion investment, is what the head of the Forest Service uh, said was be needed to get at the hazardous fuels reduction challenge. Tell us where you think that money could best go, because the kind of consensus, and Senator Heinrich and I sit next to each other in all these committees, is thinning around homes would be hugely important for today's fire risk. But I see the congresswoman and my other colleagues making a great point about the need for permanent jobs. But So walk us through what we need now and how we can segue into using that $20 billion for the long term. That's an excellent question. Thank you very much. You know, short term, when I look at just Region 6, so Forest Service Region 6 is Oregon and Washington, uh, we have something like 2 million acres of non-commercial thinning that has already been completed through the NEPA process. Uh, NEPA shelf stock is usually the term that's used. These are shovel-ready projects. Uh, you could put people to work tomorrow on those. Uh, that could be employment through the agency. That could be employment through conservation corps, nonprofits, or through for-profit businesses. Uh, that work is vital, and the sooner we start it, the better. Uh, but what you alluded to, I think, is a pipeline of work, right? Uh, and I, I think that's where the work that RPCC does and other community-based organizations is really critical. Uh, it's about building collaborative conservation. It's about working with communities to plan those projects, where they need to happen, and how they can happen in ecologically sensitive ways. Uh, there's a lot of that work that's already underway, uh, but the sooner that we can invest in programs like the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program and others that support that collaboration, the better. Thank you. My colleagues are all waiting to ask questions, Mr. Chairman Great. and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Congresswoman Chu. Well, thank you so much, uh, Senator Markey, for organizing this uh, bicameral climate task force meeting on the Climate Corps, uh, and for all my colleagues for being here. Uh, it is so great and, and encouraging to see this much interest in establishing a Climate Corps, which our country, I think, badly needs. Um, and in fact, um, Senator Cortez Masto and I uh, are uh, sponsoring the National Climate Service Corps and Careers Network Act, which is another version of having a um, having this ki kind of climate core. And I just wanted to echo what uh, you were saying, Senator Markey, about the necessity for us having jobs come out of this job training. We want to make sure that there are job openings and also apprenticeships. So that's why our legislation proposes to create the Climate Careers Network through which Am uh, AmeriCorps could collaborate with federal agencies, partner with local businesses and organizations, and maintain a database of opportunities so that employers and participants can be easily connected across the country. So um, I, for any of the guests, uh, if you 
if you could talk about uh, uh, what you think about this and the importance of proactively connecting participant, participants with uh, job and apprenticeship opportunities. And while I'm asking, let me also ask about something else, which is in uh, my bill, uh, which is having a stipend equivalent to at least $15 an hour. Um, uh, at currently, many core members are compensated at far below the minimum wage. And in fact, our Civilian Conservation Corps, it, it amounts to about $11 an hour. So uh, I wonder what you think about having a living wage um, in our climate core. So both on the network and the living wage. Sure. I'll, I'll start and then my colleagues can go. So one, I think everything you do at PowerCore PHL is paid. And I think part of the reason why Romeo and, and others can do that work and to do the training is because they can meet their, their needs with their families and, and pay their bills. And so, yes, increases to the living wage. The cost of living is going up. We're actually lucky in Philly that it's relatively low, but other parts of the country it's much higher. I think what that comes with, though, is to what you guys are all saying is you have to fund it. 40% of our budget is just wages to our young people. That's 40%. That's a huge amount of fundraising we have to do. So increasing the wage, Romeo and I are both AmeriCorps alumni. We use AmeriCorps as the service for our stra the strategy for um, how we work. But really funding an increase in what the agency can grant out, the living allowances that they're allowed to grant out, um, increasing the education awards so that people can get their associates and college degrees afterwards. Um, and really just really paying people for their time, right? So the investment that you make now in those young people and the work they do, you know what the results are. You're going to combat climate change. You're going to get a bunch of deferred maintenance done that can't get done right now. You're going to employ people who then add to the tax base and get that back in revenue. And then long term, you're setting folks up to really be able to take care of their communities themselves and be more self-sufficient. So I echo all of that. Great. Thank you um, for this question. So in terms of pipelines, I think pipelines are crucial. We need to connect um, particip participants of the CCC, for instance, to future career opportunities. However, we also know that pipelines have limits. The best way to create jobs is to spend and to spend big. So for instance, by doing complementary legislation that invests in our climate more broadly, it'll ensure that there are additional jobs for core members to then take when they finish their one, two, three years of service. Um, so, so pipelines are necessary, but we need to ensure that we're providing the, the proper support for those. Um, in terms of paying workers $15 an hour, I don't think the government or any business for that matter should pay anybody a poverty wage. I think that is essential that we set 15 as an absolute floor. From an economics perspective, the biggest determinant of what you're going to earn in your next job is what you earn in your current job. If we start people off at $10 an hour, they're going to be locked into cycles of poverty, and that is precisely what we want to uh, avoid. Thank you. Um, Senator Heimerich. There are so many incredible questions I'd like to ask all of you. I'm going to just pick one in light of all the good colleagues that are here today. Um, I'm an AmeriCorps alum as well. I uh, um, got to do some work that laid the groundwork for the reintroduction of the Mexican wolf in the Southwest. Um, it was a turning point in, in my life, and I think I've done a lot since then to sort of pay it forward. And, um, and, and I want to get at this nexus of how much we invest now and how we're going to turn these big issues around like climate change and I guess I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick with you, Mr. Bertone Riggs, because of the forest nexus that we're all struggling with in the West right now as things just burn up. Um, we need to get away from chasing our tails on this stuff to creating a healthy, resilient landscape where, where carbon is being sequestered in the soil, where carbon is being sequestered in standing timber. And to do that, you can't, you can't underinvest. Um, you have to start by really intensive work, thinning and removal. Then you move towards re in, you know, putting good fire back on the landscape and then creating long-term stewardship like you talked about. So can you talk about the nexus between you know, the, the work of a core and how we then create a, a future climate that's actually sustainable? Thank you for the question. Uh, you know, I, I think the work that cores do is is vital for a lot of this kind of fuels reduction work, uh, conservation writ large, uh, stream restoration, uh, recreation uh, maintenance as well. Uh, but I think there is an element of, of a pipeline of work needed for this as well. 
Uh, a lot of the programs that that fund this kind of restoration work, uh, you know, they may route through contractors or through other kinds of nonprofits. Uh, at least that's the model at the moment. Uh, but I think the, the core can very much feed into providing a pipeline to jobs uh, for that kind of work. Uh, building a bit on what my colleague recently said, I, I think it's also important to recognize that, well, ideally, we can get to a point where this is sustainable both environmentally and economically. At the moment, we should think about this as paying down a risk. Uh, it's investment in, in reducing a risk. This is true for forests, but I think it's also true for, for climate writ large. Uh, and so the more that we can can pay now, uh, this is essentially its, it's uh, cost in, in fire destruction and other forms of impact uh, deferred. They all made two points that are really key. One is this, this issue of paying contractors to come in. We're not paying locals all across the West, all across our national force to do this work. It's people are chasing these jobs around the country, and so you're not building community. And then you have underinvestment in the core work. I mean, I got paid $660 a month um, to, to be an AmeriCorps member. And you had it, to pay for your room and board. And I had to pay for my room and board. So I went in the hole to do it. That's, that's a recipe for not having the kind of diversity that we all expect today. So um, thank you all for the work that you're doing, because you're making the point of exactly what we need to be doing. Thank you. And, and again, uh, our goal is to have 50% of the jobs come from those communities mm -hmm. most adversely impacted. Um, and we're going to have to provide some funding to make it possible for those uh, communities to have the full representation which um, they deserve. Let me turn and recognize uh, uh, Congressman DeGoose. Thank you, uh, Senator Markey and Representative Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, first and foremost, for your leadership, and it's a pretty exciting moment with respect to uh, the Triple C and, and the real momentum that I think exists here on Capitol Hill and across the country for this concept. Uh, I represent Colorado, as Senator Wyden mentioned, a state that's been deeply impacted by Western wildfires, but we also are home uh, to some of the most magnificent remnants of the Civil Conservation Corps of the 1930s. I had a chance to tour uh, recently. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Red Rocks, the best musical venue in the world. Of course, I represent it, so I'm very biased in that regard. But um, there's a camp, Mount Morrison Camp, where uh, many of these Triple C workers worked and lived. You can still go and see the barracks and the literally the original legislation that President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed back in 1933, creating the program. And so I, it's hard to think of another program that has, I think, captured the imagination of the American people more uh, than the Triple C, uh, obviously, 21st century reimagined for uh, the, the new challenges that we face, uh, primarily the existential threat of climate change. So very grateful to all of my partners here on a bicameral basis. We have a bill with Senator Coons, uh, as well as a bill with Senator Wyden, and it's just exciting to see so much momentum in that regard. I guess my question would be to you, uh, Mr. Bertone Riggs, following up on the question that Senator Heinrich posed and the point that Senator Markey uh, astutely made around local participation. I, mean, I represent many rural communities, uh, communities that have been devastated by wildfires, and I think there's a premium for us on making sure that local communities benefit from these jobs. And you've mentioned on the contracting piece one example of a way in which we can ensure that that is the case. I don't know if you want to expound a bit further on other ways that we can make sure that rural communities receive the investment that we are speaking of when we talk about the reforestation work and uh, wildlife habitat preservation and, and public lands deferred maintenance and so much else. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I, you know, I, I did mention stewardship and result contracting. I think that's a, a critical tool uh, when we see government expenses. It allows for consideration of things like local benefits uh, or potentially even prevailing wage uh, rather than just seeking out the, the lowest cost. Uh, so that's a, that's a critical piece. But my organization works with a number of community-based uh, organizations. These are often very place-specific uh, in very small communities. Uh, they are exactly the sorts of bodies that can host whether we want to think of it as a conservation corps uh, or simply nonprofit work. Uh, those are, are places where we're not just bringing in contractors from somewhere else. Uh, it's really a local workforce and, and local members of the community. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I think investment in uh, nonprofits is, is certainly a way to do this. And, and one consideration, given the, uh, the level of crisis about this, is to consider waiving what are at times onerous matching requirements uh, for federal projects. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Senator Sanders. Um, if we are going to go forward uh, 
uh, with climate as we must in order to save the planet. We're going to have to do it through reconciliation, by the way, just so we'll get the politics correct. Um, and right now, many of us are working on a budget. But I want to throw out a, 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 a question to you, pose a problem. Uh, the Peace Corps, anyone know what the budget of the Peace Corps is roughly? I learned recently it's less than, uh, Chris, it's what, less than 500 million a year? 500 million, all right. We are talking about, I don't know what the budget is of AmeriCorps. Uh, Julia, do you know? What is it? About a billion. A billion. What we are talking about is significantly, significantly, significantly more. To be successful, and we're doing that because obviously we are facing an unprecedented and existential crisis where the United States has got to lead the world and work with other countries. Here is the dilemma, and this is big stuff. If we're going to put perhaps tens of billions of dollars into a program, we better know what the hell we're doing, all right? Or else it will backfire. Taxpayers will say, hey, you're spending all this money. I'm seeing people hanging around doing nothing. So we need a real detailed, we need help, to be honest with you, a very detailed proposal, you know, whether it's fighting forest fires in the West Coast, whether it's weatherizing all the buildings uh, all over this country, whether it's dealing with agriculture, whether it's dealing with transportation, whatever it is, if we're going to be talking about putting an unprecedented amount of money into a new program, we better know what we're talking about and have as much information and specificity as we possibly can. Uh, somebody want to comment on that? I we need, what I'm saying is to go forward, <laughs> right, we need, right. we need well, some help I'll, here. I'll start again. I think I'm preaching to the choir, but we're going to pay that money one way or another. So you either invest it in a no way. No argument that, about spending right. the money, yeah. but I want to spend it well. <laughs> right, right. Because if you don't spend it, you're going to be doing it reactively, right. right? But cities across the nation have decades, like decades worth of deferred maintenance that have gotten us to this place. The projects are there, Right. There's green infrastructure to manage stormwater that is rippling through every water utility across the country. Those require maintenance for up to 50 years to a lifetime. Those are projects that need to have folks right, working. I'm talking about, we are also putting in huge amounts of money to fight climate change in general, right. above and beyond the, but the climate core. Require people but, but I would, we need your help yeah. to be specific. You know, for example, you know, we're throwing around money. We don't know where it is now, you know. Tens of billions of dollars for electric buses alone, on top of everything else. But what we, we're going to need your help with a lot of specificity is how many people are we going to be employing? Where are they coming from? What are they going to be doing? You, what you do not want is having, for the sake of the workers, as well as taxpayers, you don't want people sitting around without anything to do. So we better know what we're doing. And the money is the, the, the least of the problems, but developing an unprecedentedly large program in this critical moment is really what we face. Uh, anyone have any other thoughts on that? So I have a few thoughts on that, Senator. Um, so first of all, you know, there is a massive backlog of deferred maintenance in many of our programs that already exist. So the Forest Service itself has a $13 billion uh, deferred maintenance problem right now. Providing them with workers to address that Good. could simply happen immediately. Good. That's $13 billion in spending. Second, we can look to state programs and just scale immediately. Senator Markey from Massachusetts, my home state, we have a program called Mass Save. It takes money from a, a carbon tax in the electricity sector and uses it to retrofit homes and businesses. Good. It saves $3 for every homeowner per dollar invested, $4 in savings for every business that the program goes in. They pay 75%, have a 25% local match, unless you're low income, and then it's free. I benefited myself from the program when I was in grad school. I had a hard time affording my own energy bill. Um, so I think looking at state examples and scaling and then subsidizing and working with our current uh, federal programs is the immediate place to start. Finally, housing retrofits and school retrofits. A lot of local communities have a hard time meeting their energy demands, and we can simply put workers to work immediately. But you're going to have to have trained workers. How are you going to be? Do you have a, talking about apprenticeship programs, etc.? Working with unions, 
Is that part of what we're talking about? Absolutely. I think that we can do both, you know, some partnerships with existing uh, NGOs and existing uh, for-profit businesses to rapidly scale that work up. I mean, one of the challenges we faced in the New Deal when we were doing something similar was the, you know, complications between going fast and doing everything precisely. Um, for instance, right when Roosevelt came into office, they created the Civil Works Administration, the precursor of the WPA and CCC. Most people don't know about this. This program. It employed 8% of the American workforce in two months. Were some people sitting around? Absolutely. But was it a small fraction? It was. But there's a lot of, you know, there are growing pains from going really right. fast. So that's something we do want to consider. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Coons. Well, thank you, Senator Markey, for uh, convening this. And um, thank you to all of my colleagues uh, who are here. All of us have some experience uh, with either the CCC or with working in one of the state uh, civilian uh, conservation corps that exists, Senator Heinrich, Senator uh, Lujan, my co-sponsors of a bill uh, in the Senate. Most of us have a bill in the House or the Senate that looks at this historic opportunity we have to combat the climate and to put people to work in positive, productive, important ways. And thank you uh, for the ways you've testified about your personal experience serving, the organization you help lead, or how this is going to impact our country as a whole. I think Chairman Sanders of the Budget Committee asks exactly the right question. Is it how quickly can we scale this up? How can we do that wisely? And how can we get as many people doing this critical work combating climate change um, in a way that is sustainable? Um, President Biden has a $10 billion proposal placeholder in his American Jobs Plan. In my view, it should be a multiple of that. It should be significantly larger than that. President Biden has nominated Michael Smith to run AmeriCorps, to run the Corporation for National and Community Service, someone who I have great confidence in, who has, I think, very good and relevant experience. Cynthia Hogan's been nominated to be the new board chair. But one of the questions Chairman Sanders is asking is, how do we scale this up in the right way? So first, one of the things I've advocated for, and I think many others have, is making sure that the benefits, the education award, the pay, the health care support for AmeriCorps members as or whatever you want to call the folks who would build out a, a civilian climate corps, I think they should be AmeriCorps members, but I'd welcome your views on that. We need to increase the pay and benefits. We need to invest in recruitment and retention to make sure that we are recruiting and retaining a diverse corps that most represents communities that have been overlooked or harmed or impacted in negative ways by climate change and by the environment. And we need to make sure this is sustainable. Yes, speed is in direct tension with sustainability um, in terms of the scale of this. So I'd welcome your thoughts, your input on how important is it to increase uh, the benefits so it's a living wage, the education award, and the training, and the recruitment to make sure that we have a diverse, local, and sustainable core, and how relevant do you think the existing national infrastructure is? Because CNCS already has commissions in all 50 states, state directors and programs in all 50 states. We could build a completely new structure, or we could use that lattice work and build up from it. What would you suggest? I mean, I built a new AmeriCorps program from the ground up, and it was no easy feat. And so, you know, I think you got to build on the infrastructure you already have. You can build complements to that, but you have an agency in AmeriCorps that has 130 cores across the nation that are already doing projects. It's really about increasing their capacity. And our U.S. military has a budget for recruitment. AmeriCorps does not. And so I think yeah, really sure. investing in what's that recruiter function that's in, that's in the communities that's getting people you know, half of our applications now come from word of mouth from our alumni, but we're, you know, we're within our own community. To do that on a bigger scale, you need to invest in, in recruitment. And absolutely, you have to increase the living wage. You have to increase the education award. It has, people have to be able to take care of themselves and their families. I'd also say that there's a policy that actually needs congressional authorization is to change the 80-20 rule, which requires that you can only have 20% of your time be training and 80% must go to direct service. Even getting that to 75, 25, 70, 30, there's a lot more flexibility to train people in the very technical skills that they need for the jobs, for these jobs and jobs of the future. Um, but also it's just more adaptive and responsive to, to local need and, and things that, you know, you might see as uh, my colleagues here are talking about, you know, forest, uh, fighting forest fires. That just takes more training than, than other things. And so I think really looking at what are those levers that are very much within, you know, your power and then 
absolutely, we had to, we got to invest if we want to get the results. But you would build up from the existing in AmeriCorps infrastructure and tweak some of the rules in exactly. terms of training time and investment in recruitment. Mm -hmm. And recruitment especially. Uh, if, if I knew about AmeriCorps mm -hmm. uh, when I was 17, 18, I probably would have came right into a AmeriCorps program due to the uh, the possibilities, like an education mm -hmm. award. Um, I told I dropped out of school. Uh, if I knew about an education award, I would have got the education award and got out. Um, also, in programs like this, uh, speaking on climate change and, and the climate in general, uh, when it comes to, we work with trees, we, we do a lot of tree planting. We probably plant over a thousand trees, a cohort. This cohort alone, we I'm for sure we planted over 500 trees. My crew specifically uh, did 250 trees. And the more work you do cleaning your neighborhood, planting trees, the more respect you gain for the earth. And it's, it, it becomes a trickle down effect because now you're going home like, hey, look, this is what the trees do for such and such. Now your mom, grandma, son, friends, now they caring about the neighborhood. So it's a trickle down effect. Thank you, Robert. Mark, any advice on building on the infrastructure and the existing system versus doing something completely new? Yeah, I, I think that's a challenging question. Um, I see no problem with building on the existing system, with mm -hmm. the exception of the fact that uh, we're going to have to pay AmeriCorps workers, you know, right. in theory, what we pay the CCC workers. Right now, um, 100 AmeriCorps workers tend to be paid 110% of an antiquated federal poverty line. 75% right. of them are earning less than $14,000 right. a year. It's been Nobody too low should for earn, a long time. Nobody should earn yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and you don't, you don't earn that. You earn a lot more than that. You just get paid that. Exactly. Um, so we're, we're exploiting our workers, and that's not, not something we can do moving forward. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Casey. Ed, thanks so much, and thanks for gathering us. I know I'm um, at the late end of this. I'm sorry I'm coming towards the end. I know we're limited on time. Um, I want to thank both the House and Senate members who are here. We don't get together enough, <laughs> and we're grateful for that. And this distinguished panel, it, that's a... Some kind of a warning, huh, for the, the weather. But Julia and Romeo, are you, I'm told both of you live in Philadelphia? Yes. In the city? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, thanks for being here today. And we haven't had a chance to, to meet. But um, I have a question for you regarding um, the, the opportunity we have, not just for conservation jobs and an effort to involve so many Pennsylvanians in combating climate change and, um, and also to... Um, uh, to take advantage of that opportunity, but I wanted to ask you about um, the opportunity we have both on public lands as well as private lands, and that the private lands part of it is not something we talk enough about. I'm, the bill I have is going to focus on that, but I wanted to get your your um, your input and your advice about um, about how to approach that. Just by way of background, and both of you know this as Pennsylvanians, we have had. Um, just in the last 50 years, a real commitment to conservation. In fact, this year is the 50th anniversary of a state constitutional provision, Article 1, Section 27, about the people having a right to clean air, pure water, preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. It's a beautiful recitation. But the previous 100 and, or 125 years was the opposite. We, we. Uh, and we allowed industry to kind of do whatever the hell it wanted for uh, to extract energy and, and the like. So we finally got our act together in 1971. We also have a state that is, by one estimate, when you add up all of the farmland and forestry, about 85% of the state is covered by that, 48 rural counties. So my point is there's a lot of land, a lot of turf for this, and as well as a, a great opportunity. But I wanted to ask you, in terms of the goals we have to combat climate change and to, to make our ag communities, our, our farmers and farm families part of this, uh, how do you approach that question of the, the, uh, using both the, the opportunity for public lands as well as private lands? Do you have any thoughts on that? So that we strongly believe that you can advance individuals by advancing the community. And so right. if it has a community benefit, I think we can all, you know, roll up our sleeves and, and, and make an impact. I think it's very, you know, it needs to be very tailored to the local community. So the issues that we have in Pennsylvania, but even different regions of Pennsylvania are different from each other. And so I think really building bills that allow the flexibility for local communities to set, you know, what are the projects that we really need that are going to hit our climate goals, um, and how do we get there? 
you know, I know that in, in, in the Delaware River watershed to get to 30 by 30, we need to do three times what we're already doing in conservation work, and that's going to take a lot of public-private partnerships. So I think it really is building bills that allow that flexibility for local communities to set that um, and to meet these ambitious national goals together. But I think it's going to look very different whether you're in Oregon, Pennsylvania, you know, Florida. And so I would just say allow us some flexibility to do what we do. Mm -hmm. Romeo, anything? And I wanted to ask you, is when you talked about that tree planting, where was most of that done? Um, Fairmount Park. That's Fairmount great. Park. Uh, mostly uh, in the West Philly area, mm -hmm. Fairmount Park. Uh, um, but what's your question before that, if you don't mind me? We're yeah, we're just talking about public and private lands, utilizing the opportunity for both. But um, um, I know it's a... a a lot of land in Philadelphia alone that is not being touched, mm -hmm. um, whether that be the city not having the workers to touch the area or not having the permission to touch the area, mm -hmm. and opening up those areas would, of course, create more jobs, more job opportunities, and uh, more opportunity to uh, conserve those parks by planting trees, doing land care, and caring about you know the environment and the neighborhood. Well, I commend you on that work. Thanks for the work you've done. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and thanks to all of our witnesses. Thanks to the uh, Senate and House members for joining us. This is a very important subject. So just turn in, Representative uh, Ocasio-Cortez, would you like to say something here? At sure the end? thing. Uh, thank you, Senator Markey. Thank you, everyone, again, for joining us. I think I, it would be remiss if we didn't mention, I think, of the generational dynamic that this challenge represents. I think one thing that's really important as well is that in the Civilian Climate Corps bill that Senator Markey and I have introduced, there is no age limit um, to participation. I think this is incredibly important because it represents the economy. It's reflective of the economy that we are now growing up into. Especially during the pandemic, people have fallen out of unemployment into long-term unemployment which does require these kinds of interventions in order to get people ramped back into the economy again. But specifically from a generational dynamic, young people, the last time that our generation and that I personally witnessed a thriving economy was during the 90s when we were kids. Then the dot-com bust happened, 9-11 happened shortly after that. We were raised in a decade of war, in an impending climate crisis. And then um, from there, a catastrophic recession that most working people never fully recovered from. We were told to go to school and to get a good job, and that a quarter million dollars of student loan debt would easily pay itself off. And then after that, if you wanted a job and go to graduate school, another quarter million is what would create economic opportunity for you. And we graduate into a recession as we watch our country go up in flames or drown in, in rising sea levels. A civilian climate core, ha and so the question that we have is we have a student loan crisis, a housing crisis, a climate crisis. How on earth can we possibly overcome this? And I think one of the ways that we overcome it is by being one of the most unionized workforces and unionized generations in American history. By collecting our power as workers in the economy, we can take our futures back. And what's important about a civilian climate core is that it is an on-ramp and can function as an on-ramp to unionization and to, when we plug this in with union labor. But it's going to require putting us to work in the externalities of climate change, in reforesting land, in carbon mitigation, but also in resiliency and in the justice work. You know, planting trees, this isn't volunteer work. It's how we put the carbon back in the ground. It's how we actually take our future back into our own hands. But Chevron is not going to make those jobs. We as a public and as a people have to make those jobs, which is why I think this investment in a climate core is so crucially important. It's doing the work to draw down, which is not profitable, but it is beneficial. <laughs> um, 
And so all of that is to say is that in also looking at the other jobs that we need to do, we need to look at where uh, unjust jobs and unjust labor is coming from right now. In California wildfires, we're using prison labor by all forms and by all active, you know, by many advocates, slave labor, uncompensated labor, and we're sending imprisoned people to go fight wildfires. And these people are, no, are, are nobly, while incarcerated by this country, saving the lives of others. But it shouldn't have to be that way. And it's also not enough. It's also not enough. I mean, that labor force was completely exhausted last year as well. So we need to mobilize people to save our own lives. And I think that's really what this is all about. And I, I sincerely thank the senator for hosting um, this forum. And I sincerely thank each and every one of you for really leading the work and hopefully making this happen. Thank you. So um, thank you, uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. Thanks to everyone else who was here. So time is of the essence. As Senator Sanders said, there's a reconciliation bill coming, and we have to figure this out. And all the people at this table uh, are going to be a part of this coalition, along with um, our witnesses, along with labor unions, uh, along with um, city and state governments who can help us to construct something here that will work as a pathway, as a pathway for ultimately millions of Americans uh, to wind up with good-paying union jobs so that they can take care of their own families as they take care of our country and our planet. So that's really what the Civilian um, Climate Corps is all about, okay? The Civilian Conservation Corps was President Roosevelt's uh, most favorite um, program in terms of how the public viewed it, and for good reason. And even that program was completely imperfect in terms of how it treated uh, minorities in our country. We can do a lot better, uh, and we can do it in the near term if we work together to telescope the time frame so we can draft all of the legislation using all the good ideas uh, to get it into the reconciliation bill so that the Bernie uh, and uh, our leadership uh, can get it onto the Senate floor. So thank you all so much for being here, and our work continues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.